on behalf of Bethlehem Island Academy and EAG Student Chapter, I would like to welcome you to, to today's webinar, Basics of Petroleum Geomechanics. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Abdurrahman Fouad, an exploration and development engineer at Sudabit Company, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Our guest instructor will be Ms. Aile Serasa, a petroleum engineering program leader at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation. Ms. Aile has an extensive experience in the area of engineering and applied uh, session as an academic course. She graduated for, uh, with Master's of Science in Geology from National University of Malaysia in 2016. And she is currently at the final stage of her PhD in geology from the same university. Now I'll leave you with uh, Mr. Sergio Avila, the Vice President of EAG e Chapter. Please, Mr. Uh, Avila. Uh, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on the country from which you are accompanying us today. My name is Aset Sergio Avila. I'm the vice president of the EAG student chapter from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, which is located in the Bogota headquarters. Uh, we welcome all attendees to this space, and we are very thankful and blissful with Petronial's academy's invitation to our chapter to participate in this event as collaborators. Um, furthermore, we will also like to thank Elise Raza for sharing her knowledge and experience hereby. Uh, we hope you all get to enjoy this webinar and thank you all for coming. Greetings from Colombia. Thank you, Mr. Rafila, for the kind words. Now, before we start the session, I would like to notify you that uh, we will have a live Q&A at the end. So please write, write down your questions in the chat, chat uh, area or section. Now, uh, without further ado, Ms. Eileen, the mic is yours. All right. <clears throat> um, good day, everyone. Thank you, uh, moderator, for your introduction. Before I start my presentation, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. Uh, or before that, can you see my screen? Just want to check. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. All right. So before we, uh, before I start with my presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to welcome um, the participant. Okay, thank you for spending your Saturday uh, to listen to my uh, presentation. Uh, it is actually 10 p.m. in Malaysia here. It's quite late. Uh, wherever you go or wherever you are, uh, I'd like to wish all of you um, good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening. Right. Um, I'd like to also express uh, my uh, appreciation to Petronal Academy for uh, approaching me and allowing me to give uh, you know this uh, knowledge sharing uh, session. So the uh, same appreciation goes to also the um, AGE uh, student chapter UNL uh, Bogota, right? So um, my name is Aili Sofia Nasarasa, uh, and I am the program leader of the Petroleum Engineering Program uh, at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, right? So um, uh, the petroleum. Uh, let me just briefly introduce to my uh, program, right? Uh, the Petroleum Engineering Program in APU is actually a newly developed program. Uh, it was established back in 2016, okay, under the uh, School of Engineering, okay, and. Um, under the School of Engineering, okay, we are also offering uh, four others um, undergraduate uh, degree program. Okay, so that includes the uh, mechatronics. Uh, we have telecommunication, electrical and uh, electrical and electronics engineering, as well as uh, computer engineering. Right. So um, here, I would like to just share some snippet, okay, of our campus. Right, and. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with APU or first time hearing it, uh, our campus is actually located in the capital of Malaysia, which is Kuala Lumpur. Right. So um, these are the contents uh, of my presentation. Right. Um, this webinar will. Uh, this webinar aims to 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 introduce okay uh, the basic concept 
of uh, geomechanics, okay? And who would benefit uh, from this session? Students who are actually, um, you know, planning to do geomechanics or um, people who are not uh, familiar with geomechanics, okay, would hopefully uh, benefit uh, from this webinar session. So uh, this is how I would uh, arrange my presentation, okay, for today. Uh, I will start uh, by looking at the uh, introduction, okay, uh, or the fundamental of geomechanics, followed by the process in any uh, geomechanics analysis, right? Um, followed by the application, okay, a little bit of application on how geomechanics would um, is actually, you know, uh, is actually um, part of the uh, oil and gas uh, industry, right? Okay, so <clears throat> I would like to just emphasize again that uh, the contents of my, my presentation is actually an introduction, okay? So um, those who are not exactly in this industry, okay, who, are, who is not exactly in the field would also um, understand, okay, the concept because it's going to be a very, you know, uh, on the surface level only, right? Okay, so uh, let me start with the first part, okay, which is the principles of geomechanics, okay? So here you can see, okay, that the petroleum geomechanics, okay, it deals with the subsurface rock deformation and how this uh, behavior will affect the exploration, the development, okay, as well as the production of oil and gas, okay, right? So uh, you can see here that the geomechanics is actually closely tied and applied uh, throughout the exploration and production cycle. It starts, okay, definitely in the uh, exploration stage, all right, where knowledge of geomechanics is used to model the inside to um, reservoir or formation stresses, okay, as well as uh, for profiling the uh, rock properties, right? Now, during the um, during the initial uh, drilling operation, okay, the actual drilling operation, uh, what happened here is that geomechanics knowledge is also used to predict uh, borehole stability, right? And other than that, it can also be used to predict the sanding problem, problem, okay, during the development phase, right? And then you also have uh, the stages of monitoring okay, during the production phase, okay, uh, where uh, geomechanics knowledge is uh, used to um, monitor okay, the effect of reservoir uh, stimulation. Okay, and apart from that, this uh, geomechanics um, analysis is also implemented in uh, ensuring the safe condition is uh, is met okay during any for example your uh, developments okay if you look at closely at this uh, illustration okay you can see that the most significant areas in which geomechanics is useful is during the development phase okay so this is uh, the stage okay where uh, it is very important okay for for us to monitor and predict the reservoir response to the surrounding stress state, uh, stress state okay? So between this area here, okay? So what happened uh, if, if, if you were to understand what is actually geomechanics, okay? Initially, the total stress in the reservoir is also supported, okay? Partly by the fluid pressure, okay? Now, once you start producing, okay? Definitely, uh, you will start to deplete the reservoir, all right? And when that happened, okay, the in situ stress will be altered, okay, in such a way that um, the load redistrib the load distribution, okay, will be uh, redistributed, okay, majorly to the rock matrix, okay. So this is where we actually observe a significant uh, increase in terms of the formation um, compaction. Okay, and uh, when you have formation compaction, this is where you will have problems such as subsidence, okay? And this will pose uh, problems, um, including well stability, sorry, well completion stability, okay? Uh, it would cause uh, casing collapse, all right? As well as um, severe sending uh, production across the field, right? And then towards the end of the life, okay? Of the field, okay, of the reservoir, okay? Apologies, okay? Um, 
when the field reaches the end of its uh, productive life, I would say, okay, operators are using secondary, okay, operators are using tertiary recovery technique to maximize, okay, uh, whatever uh, remaining um, hydrocarbon that is left in the reservoir, okay. Now, when you do that, okay, you are injecting extra pressure into reservoir, okay. Now, all of this extra pressure that is injected <clears throat> into the reservoir will somehow affect the reservoir stress redistribution. So it's very important for us to monitor, okay, what will happen, okay, uh, when you do this kind of activity, right? Again, um, in this case, right, we need geomechanical analysis, okay, to predict the response of rocks, okay, towards this kind of stress uh, redistribution or stress reorientation, right, so that we can safely meet the objectives of the operation, okay, which is to ensure uh, the uh, integrity of the reservoir is not compromised, all right? And at the same time, uh, we wanted to definitely uh, maximize the recovery of hydrocarbon. Right. <clears throat> the oil and gas exploration and production activities are heavily altering the inside to um, conditions of reservoir rock, okay? As I mentioned before, okay, when you drill, okay, when you uh, inject fluid, all these activities, okay, will somehow alter the uh, condition of reservoir rock, all right? And this behave, behavior um, is affected by several changes, okay? Especially in terms of um, stress change, okay? When you have temperature change, as well as the pressure changes, right? Now, when we look into um, the stresses and uh, strength in the subsurface, okay, they're actually in equilibrium. Okay, they're actually in equilibrium, except um, definitely in areas where you have um, very active um, seismic activity. Okay, so that is an exception. Now, um, oil and gas, <clears throat> oil and gas activities that is associated uh, with exploration and production, such as drilling. Okay, when you do stimulation. Okay, um, all this um, can potentially alter the equilibrium of the formation. So this is where. Uh, the main goal of rock mechanics assessment is important, okay? Where uh, what we wanted to achieve, okay, is that uh, we wanted to predict when failure will happen and where failure will occur. And when we have that prediction, okay, when we have that prediction, then we will be able to um, come up with some, you know, mitigation plan uh, that is suitable to mitigate all the risk, right? So in the past few years, um, the role of geomechanics is actually becoming significant, right? So it is not surprising, okay, because nowadays um, when you look into exploration, okay, we do not have what we call as easy oil anymore, all right? Majority of our reservoir is actually located in a uh, um, you know, deeper part of the earth, okay, and much more complex geological formation, okay? Uh, much more complex and much more uh, challenging reservoir, right? So... Um, this is where, okay, um, it is it, it is not something that is uh, normal, okay, it's not a norm, okay, so that's why uh, a thorough geomechanical analysis is, is, is very important, okay, so that we will know what to expect uh, if we were to produce from that particular field, right? And apart from safety, uh, definitely uh, when you are developing a field, okay, you, you are constantly in contact with uh, the uh, regulatory body, okay, or the NGO, right? So this is where they will keep on, you know, uh, pressuring you in terms of the um, safety, okay, and the risk, okay? So this is, again, uh, where geomechanics um, complete assessment is important so that you can actually factor it uh, to look at what kind of uh, problem, okay, that it could pose on the environment, right? So... Um, <clears throat> so I did mention that the um, geological formation, okay, is constantly under stress, okay? So given here, okay, is uh, four examples, okay, that shows you how uh, reservoirs are actually uh, put under pressure, okay? So we have the gravitational loading here, okay? We have the effect of plate uh, tectonics. We have the effect of temperature, right, as well as the effect of stress relaxation, right? Now, let's have a look at the first one, okay, which is gravitational loading, okay? 
So uh, from the principle of uh, sedimentation, okay, we know that sediments, they are deposited in a continuous horizontal layer. Okay? And as the, as the sediments are accumulated, okay, as they are deposited, what happened is that um, the overburden, the, over, the overlying formation okay, would impose uh, such uh, you know, a, a greater overburden stress. Okay? So this is where uh, you will observe um, the stress changes, right, over time that will occur in your formation, okay? And the second factor here is the plate tectonics, okay? So um, what is plate tectonics? Plate tectonics is basically the movement, okay, the movement of the lithosphere or the crust, right? And uh, when uh, this occur, okay, you can have what uh, the condition of uplift, okay, as well as the subsidence, okay. So what actually happened here is that this process of plate tectonics, okay, this movement of plates, will uh, redistribute, okay. It will redistribute, it will redistribute some portion of mass, okay, and this uh, alteration, okay. So this alteration will either give you some, you know, thickening or thinning of the crust, and again, it will disturb the equilibrium, the equilibrium. Um, of the formation. And then you have the, uh, the effect of thermal here, okay, the thermal effect. So this is actually taken from one of the research, okay. So uh, the thermal effect is, al is also a contributing factor uh, of rock strength, okay. Where, uh, when we talk about rock, okay, rock is formed by the, you know, um, constituent of different types of minerals, okay, we know that, right. And, um, this thermal effect is closely related to the mineral composition of the rock, okay? And the nature of the bonding between these minerals, okay? So what happened under the influence of temperature, okay? Um, but also depending upon the um, thermal expansion uh, coefficient of the mineral itself, okay? The, what happened is that the contact surfaces, okay, between these minerals, uh, they will become um, increased significantly. Okay, all right. So when you have changes, okay, when you have alteration in the structural um, orientation here, okay, so this leads to, um, you know, these structural changes will also give impact to the value of strength parameter of the rock, okay. However, uh, if you look at, um, however, okay, the effect of thermal here, okay, it does not necessarily only affecting the, stra uh, the contact surfaces, okay? Um, the, the analysis here, okay, the analysis in terms of, you know, to understand the effect of temperature will depend on the problem that you are trying to solve, okay? Either you wanted to see the effect of uh, temperature on the mineralogy, okay? Whether you wanted to study the effect of temperature on um, thermal uh, evaporation, okay? Um, thermal cracks, okay, or even the oxidation of minerals. So all this will be tied back, uh, will be tied back, okay, to your uh, approach, okay, or to your um, objective, right? And then we have uh, stress relaxation here. So stress relaxation here is actually something that is, I find quite interesting, okay? So what happened in stress relaxation here is that it is normally observed in uh, visco, uh, visco elastic materials, okay? Any material that exhibit, you know, um, the elastic property as well as um, viscous, okay? So under this condition, okay, uh, to understand stress relaxation, um, imagine you are holding a material at a particular stress, Okay, at a particular stress, okay? Now, over time, okay, the amount of stress that you need to hold that uh, material, okay? Uh, sorry, uh, over time, okay, you will require less amount of stress, okay, to, to keep that, uh, to keep that uh, material, okay, uh, under that amount of strength. So that is basically uh, what stress relaxation is and is normally observed in uh, viscoelastic materials, okay, right? And uh, these are basically um, <clears throat> what causes, okay, the uh, stresses that is subjected uh, in the formation. All right. 
Now, the geological formation, um, when we talk about failure, okay, when we talk about uh, deformation and failure of uh, geological formation, um, we wanted to observe the relationship between stress versus strain. Okay, we wanted to observe the relationship between stress as well as stress, uh, strain. Okay, so given here are some of the um, example, okay, of failure, okay, in rock, okay, rock failure under different types of stress, right? Now, this failure can range from, you know, compressive uh, stress, okay, uh, tensile stress, shear stress, and uh, when you when you look into uh, geomechanical analysis, okay, all these stresses should be considered, okay, uh, for risk assessment, okay. Um, again, when you look at this, okay, you can see that this is where the role of geomechanics is relevant, okay, as the uh, geomechanical assessment will will allow you to predict where and uh, when okay, the failure on your reservoir rock will occur as accurately as possible. Okay? But sometimes, okay, um, formation failure can also be regarded as an opportunity. Okay? It's not something that is you know, always bad. Okay? Sometimes it can also be regarded as an opportunity. Okay? But however, it's, it is just in some cases. Okay? Um, this is, uh, some of the example is when you are doing fracturing. Okay? Um, in, in, in fracturing uh, operations, okay, um, this, you know, formation failure or fracture in the subsurface can be leveraged, okay, but provided you are actually fracturing in the correct orientation of horizontal stresses, okay. So this is just giving you some example on how rock material can actually fail, okay, it can, uh, rock can actually fail under the actual splitting where you can see that this is uh, basically uh, failure under the compressive uh, stress, and then you have shearing, okay, along a single plane, right? And you can also have multiple fracture uh, uh, failure, okay? And then you have the tensile failure here, all right? And then um, once you have established, okay, or once you have understand um, the, the, the relationship between stress and strain, okay, in, 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 in the sense that when you apply, for example, 20 megapascal, okay, then you will get, some amount of strain of your rock, okay? So you can actually plot the deformation of the rock, okay? And uh, come up with some conclusion on your formation. So all this data, okay, um, of uh, failure, be it under compressive stress, be it under tensile or shear stress, can be plotted, okay, uh, in a stress and strain curve, right? So a stress and strain curve is actually one of the uh, classic uh, relationship, okay? And uh, it can be visualized, okay, by this curve, okay? So if you look at this curve, it is actually divided into two sections, okay? So you have the pre-critical and you have the post-critical uh, stress here, okay? So the pre-critical the pre phase here, all right, is the rising, uh, trend of curve here, okay? So we can observe that there is an increase in both of the stress as well as the strain until the sample reaches its uh, critical point or peak strength here, okay? And after that, you can see the, uh, the post-critical stress, okay? The declining part of the, uh, the curve, okay? Now, on this decreasing part of the curve, all right, or the post-critical uh, post phase, we observe that there is a decrease in uh, stress until it reaches the value of residual stress. Now, this is just a very generalized stress and strain curve, okay? Depending on different materials, okay, depending on different lithology, okay, different rock will give different trend, okay? Different rock will definitely give, give you different trend of stress and strain, okay? Sometimes you could even have a more, um, you know, profile than this, okay? But this is just showing you uh, on how do we actually uh, visualize the deformation, okay? It, it is in terms of plotting the stress as well as the strain that uh, occurred on the uh, rock material, okay? <clears throat> now, of course, 
apologies, okay. Of course, all this, okay, is, uh, like I mentioned before, this is what we would like to uh, visualize uh, conceptually, okay. In, in, a, in a realistic, in a realistic uh, condition, okay, rock will not actually behave exactly the same like this. So that's why it's very important for you to understand uh, how rock will actually behave okay, by understanding the deformation of the uh, rock. Okay, so uh, what could be the factor that will affect uh, you know the stress and the strain effect on the on the rock? Okay, so it can be contributed. Okay. It can be attributed by uh, numerous factors. Okay, so uh, definitely the first factor that is uh, that will cause. Sorry, definitely the first factor that will give. Um, you know that will give a variation. Okay, in terms of your stress and strain is the rock, rock property itself. Okay, so you have strong rocks. Okay, you have soft rock. Okay, and then you have rock that exhibit. You know this uh, creeping or viscous material, okay? So these uh, different types of rock will definitely come out with uh, different types of stress and strain relationship. So it's very important for you to understand uh, what kind of material you're dealing with so that you can actually match it with the correct model to understand the deformation of the rock, okay? Another factor that will cause um, uh, variation in terms of the stress and strain relationship of the rock is uh, in terms of do you have any um, you know discontinuity or any initial uh, fractures inside your reservoir okay so this will also give um, you know different variable sorry different variety of stress entry relationship okay and that is looking at the material itself okay um, when we're looking at external factor okay uh, when you do the testing okay uh, you also have to look at the condition on what kind of condition that you are set that you are that what kind of condition okay that you are putting your um what kind of condition that you are testing your sample in okay so external condition can also affect okay external condition can also affect uh the the type of uh, stress and strain relationship that you will uh, obtain in the end okay so that includes um the range of stress that you applied, okay, your uh, size sample, okay, all right. And I did mention before, all right, uh, different types of rock will definitely give you different types of um, trend, okay. So for strong rocks, for example, uh, granite, okay, this type of rock, they are much more stronger, okay, they are stiff, okay, sandstone and um, carbonate, I would say, no, no, mudstone, okay, they are weak, okay, they are weak and they are soft. Okay, definitely they will exhibit different trend of stress and strain. Okay, and then like I said, uh, there are some materials that is you know that exhibit the viscous, uh, flowy, uh, characteristics over time. Okay, so this is where you observe this condition um, in uh, salt. Okay, salt rocks. Okay, all right. So um, yes, so that is basically what uh, the initial step. Okay, the initial step of understanding rock. Is, okay, you have to understand uh, the relationship, okay, between the stress, okay, as well as the strain, okay. Now, when you look at this stress and strain uh, graph, okay, what can you actually, um, what can actually, what can, what kind of parameter that you can actually obtain from this stress and strain, okay? So stress and strain, stress and strain curve, okay. If you look at it, it's very simple. However. It can provide us with a lot of property. Okay, it can provide us with many uh, rock property. Okay, so this include your rock strength, definitely. Okay, your rock strength. Okay, it can give you uh, the value of the toughness, toughness of your rock. Okay, the elasticity, the trend of elongation. Okay, as well as the yield. Okay, all this information can be obtained. It can be extracted from this stress and strain curve, all right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the term, okay, rock strength is just basically, you know, the point of failure, okay? It is the uh, resistance of rock to permanent or plastic deformation that is basically rock strength, okay? And then you have rock um, toughness, okay? So tough is just uh, basically the ability of your rock to um, resist 
uh, fracture. Okay, so the 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 higher the energy that that you require to fracture a rock, okay, then it means that uh, your rock is considered as tough, right? And then you have the uh, elasticity. Okay, so the elasticity is basically this um, linear response of the rock. Okay, so that uh, explains the ability of the rock to once it is deformed. Okay, it it, it it, it shows, you know, uh, how well, no, rock, elastic, rock, rock elasticity basically measures how well the rock to resist and to recover, yeah, to resist and to recover from the deformation, okay, that is, uh, that is applied by the stress, okay, and then you have yield, okay, so yield is basically a point where, um, where rock will start to begin to deform plastically, okay, so when you look at this, um, I did mention that it has it is actually divided into two sections. This part of the section is the elastic deformation of rock, and this is the plastic deformation of rock. Okay, so you will be surprised that rock is actually behaving elastically, okay, at initial stress, uh, stress level here. Okay, now um, the pre-existing rock stresses, okay, before any alteration. Uh, and intervention are uh, actually the dominant stress. There are the dominant stresses uh, that will uh, give you the initial performance of the reservoir, okay? So therefore, if you wanted to do any geomechanical uh, assessment, okay, it all starts by analyzing the current uh, formation stress state, okay? You need to profile the rock as well and as well as the pressure profiles. So what does it mean? It means that understanding the geological history of the formation, okay, is uh, very important. Okay, it's very crucial uh, uh, to to ensure that you have a reliable geomechanical analysis. All right. So um, moving on to the process. Okay. So now that you have understand the fundamental of geomechanics, okay, it's just basically understanding what will happen to rock under stress. Okay, we are we are looking at the response of rock under uh, under stress. Okay, we wanted to look at the deformation. Now look at uh, now um, the next part of the presentation. Okay, we'll be looking at the processes. Okay, um, how exactly do we start a geomechanical analysis? Okay, so I have uh, summarized it okay, into these uh, six steps. Okay, where we will start with data review first. Okay, and then some experimental studies is needed, okay? And then you can proceed with either doing quantitative modeling or numerical uh, simulation, okay? And then once you have uh, obtained your uh, quantitative model or your uh, numerical simulation or your 3D model, okay? Then uh, after that, okay, you can do some assessment, okay? Uh, for you to, to, to propose, okay? Uh, any mitigation plan, okay? For the, for the purpose of uh, integrity of the formation. And after that, uh, the model update, okay? So let me just explain to you on what are the process step-by-step, step, okay? So the first step, okay, I did mention before, is that in, in order for you to understand your reservoir or your formation, okay, definitely some understanding of the geological history is needed, okay? You will need some basic of geology, okay? If you would like, if you, if you wanted to, um, understand easier, okay, what's actually happening um, throughout the life of the of the reservoir. Okay, it, it helps us to understand what exactly uh, the behavior of the reservoir. Okay, so when you understand geology, okay, it means that you would understand the earth better. Okay, in terms of you know how the rock was formed. Okay, how sediments are deposited. How it were. How it is. You know. Um, how it is. Uh, what is that, how it undergo the digenesis process, all that, okay? You will understand more and it's going to be easier for you to relate uh, to the uh, geomechanic, uh, to the analysis that you are trying to uh, piece together. Okay, all right. And then, um, what did I mention? Okay, sorry. Yeah, and then you have the historical, uh, sorry, the data analysis, okay? So, uh, historical analysis, uh, or any analytical work, okay, will uh, is needed to be collected, okay. So before you start with a geomechanical analysis, okay, you need to collect data, okay. So what kind of data that you need, okay? So this data includes uh, your uh, geology 
data, okay? You need your wireline log data, okay? You need your seismic data, okay? You need your profi pressure profiles, okay? You need uh, well records data, okay? And um, yeah, past geology data, okay? You need to collect all this data, all right? So that you can, um, you can examine, okay? And then you can collect what are the parameters that is needed for the assessment, okay? So um, the most important data definitely will be the log data, okay? And by analyzing the log data, okay, uh, some important parameter can be uh, extracted, okay, which is the uh, elastic property, okay? The elastic property um, of your formation, okay? A dynamic elastic property, okay? Now, what is dynamic elastic property? So elastic property here is your uh, young modelers, okay, the value of your but modelers, okay, your shear modelers, okay, all these values, all right, as well as your uh, compressional and shear uh, velocities data are needed, okay, for you to move to, uh, to for in order for you to move to uh, the uh, assessment, okay, assessment of the uh, geomechanics, okay. Now, after you have collected all your data, okay, you have your log data, okay, and you have your seismic section, okay, all that, then. Definitely, you will need to do some experimental study. Okay, so why do you need to, to do experimental study? So experimental study is important, okay, where you will actually look at, uh, you know, your sample and then rock that is collected, okay, your core sample will be tested, okay, and this will help us to establish the stress strain curve that I have showed in the previous slide, okay? So this is why experimental studies is important, okay, because you wanted to establish the deformation behavior of your uh, reservoir rock, okay, all right? And then, in terms of rock testing, okay, there are many testing of rock mechanics uh, that can be done, okay? However, the most, the most uh, versatile and the most common testing, okay, is called the triaxial testing, okay? You have the uniaxial compression uh, testing, okay? You have tensile as well as shear testing, okay? All this, are the most common types of rock mechanics or experimental studies that is done, okay? Why? Because all of this testing can give you, okay, your stress and strain uh, profile of your rock, okay? All right? So, um, when you are doing this testing, okay, um, or from the from the establishment of your stress and uh, stress and strain uh, relationship, okay, there are other parameters that you can actually um interpret from your graph okay from your curve from the relationship so this includes um the young modelers okay you can also extract the value of poison ratio okay friction angle all right all this value can be predicted from all this uh, experimental study okay and also when you have data that is actually taken from the actual experimental studies okay you can actually do correlation okay between static and dynamic okay so that uh, this model can give you the over the overview trend okay of the entire formation right so uh, that's basically uh, the first two steps okay you collect data and then you do experimental studies now once you have collected data and then once you have established your uh, your uh, stress and strain curve, then it is time for you to select a constitutive model, okay? So a constitutive modeling basically um, provide you, okay, with the uh, behavior of deformation, okay? It tells you how rocks are behaving um, or responding to stress, okay? How they're behaving uh, with the change in pressure, okay? With the change in temperature as well, okay? Among others, all right? So uh, when we look into constitutive law or constitutive modeling, okay? So in rock mechanics, okay, there are too many constitutive modeling out there, okay? And each of the constitutive modeling are tied to a specific type of, you know, rock behavior, okay? So if you wanted to know what is constitutive modeling, okay, um, the simplest constitutive model, okay, is the uh, elastic, okay? The linear elastic uh, constitutive model. So when you look at that, you know that, uh, you, it can be interpreted that, you know, with this amount of stress, okay, this will be the expected uh, amount of strain that you will, uh, that we will observe on that formation, okay? Now, that is the simplest, okay? Now, when you factor in other factors, okay, that is tied closely to the formation rock, okay, for example, when you have, um, when you 
put in the porosity, okay, when you put in any other um, data that you would like to investigate, the complexity of the constitutive model, okay, will become uh, much more higher, okay, the complexity level, okay. So this is where you look at um, if you are, if you if you ever heard of, okay, uh, we we look into poroelastic uh, constitutive law, okay, we have viscoelastic constitutive law, all right, and then uh, in, in a much more advanced, okay, you have the Tresca model, okay, you have the Moore column, you have the Morgi column, you have the Griffith column, Cam Clay model, there's too much of this constitutive modeling. So the idea here is, okay, is to, for you to select one constitutive model that is actually, that can basically, uh, model the behavior of your reservoir rock properly, okay? And from there, okay, you can uh, basically uh, update okay, the model to match uh, the condition, right? So that is in terms of constitutive uh, modeling, right? So um, how do we choose the correct constitutive model, okay? Basically, in order for you to um, choose the constitutive model, okay, well, basically, it depends on the material itself, okay? It depends on the property of your rock first, okay? It depends on um, the expected magnitude of uh, stress change, okay? Uh, it depends on what kind of range of stress that you are planning to apply, okay? And uh, the loading rate, okay? How fast do you want your, 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 your rock to be, you know, to be... To be what is that? Uh, how how fast? Okay, do you want the testing to be done? Okay, so that is um, some of the consideration that you have to uh, think of. Okay, when you wanted to decide on a constitutive uh, model. Okay, and then nowadays, okay, we are looking, uh, we are moving, okay, towards uh, developing the numerical simulation. Okay, so um, some of you might have heard the mechanical earth model. Okay, so this MEM, okay, mechanical earth model is basically. Um, you know, it's actually a numerical um, simulation, okay? So at this stage of numerical uh, simulation, okay, at this stage of numerical simulation, this is where all the fun part happens, okay? Why do I say fun part happens? Because this is where a geomodeler, okay, will develop their 3D model, okay? And then they will put in all of the data that they obtain from, you know, the first few steps here, experimental studies, consistent modeling, okay, your data review, okay? They put in all the data and then they simulate to the condition, sorry, they simulate the condition um, of the formation under various possible scenario, okay, depending on what you are trying to uh, study, all right, okay. So uh, most of the time, this uh, numerical simulation uh, involves, okay, why do you do numerical simulation, okay? Normally, most of the time, you will do it to predict, for example, the integrity of your cap rock, okay? You wanted to see if you do secondary recovery, if you do injection, for example, um, what would this additional pressure would, would, would do to your formation, okay? Uh, if you're doing uh, CO2 storage and sequestration, okay, you wanted to see uh, if there's any leakage, okay? You wanted to also study um, fracture uh, or fault reactivation. You wanted to also look at... Um, sanding problem, okay, the onset of your sand uh, formation, you wanted to look at uh, changes in rock properties, okay, you wanted to also look at the uh, stimulation, okay, for example, you do hydraulic fracturing, okay, you wanted to see the extension of your, you know, the fracture initiation, okay, and yeah, all these are where the objective, okay, comes uh, when you are doing the simulation, okay, so you simulate based on the uh, approach that you are trying to, uh, to to understand. Okay, all right. So um, I did mention about the uh, mechanical earth model here. Okay, so the mechanical earth model is basically a numerical representation uh, of the current state stress state. Okay, the current uh, stress state uh, of rock mechanical properties. Okay, and we study it. Okay, uh, with respect to depth. That is mechanical earth model, right? So um, in challenging reservoir condition, okay, where problems like uh, reservoir compaction, uh, casing failure, okay, again, sending problem, okay, that are most likely to happen. Um, when, once you build your mechanical earth model, okay, then you will be able to um, predict, okay, the, uh, the severity of this problem. 
okay, the severity of this problem, okay. So by building the MEM, okay, be it 1D or 3D, okay, uh, viable prediction can be made uh, relevant for a geomechanical analysis, okay. So when you construct MEM, uh, it requires a collection of a lot of data, okay. You need your mud weight data, you need your uh, log data, you need your regional geology data, okay, you need your stress map, you need your inside to temperature pressure data, all this is needed, okay? So sometimes it's very difficult to develop it, okay? But if you have the data on hand, okay, then it's going to serve as the best, you know, analysis uh, that you can uh, come up with, right? So um, again, uh, depending on the objective of what you're trying to study, okay? Whether maybe you simply, for example, you wanted to build MEM so that you can study the effect of shell drilling, okay? You wanted to build MEM to look at the safe, mud window, for example, that kind of that, okay? Your MEM can be simple or can be complex, okay? The more data that you have, okay, the more conclusive is your MEM, okay? All right? Um, but most of the time, I would say that the MEM is, um, is used to visualize the stress orientation, okay? All right? And um, when you look at the stress orientation, this is uh, important in terms of understanding or, you know, when you are trying to propose for highly deviated well or horizontal drilling. So this is where you have to understand the stress orientation, um, yeah, in the formation, okay? So um, when this MEM I use uh, properly, okay, it can provide uh, operators, okay, with uh, good prediction, okay, on how the production will affect the total stress or effective stress, okay? Uh, it can give operators some idea on the extension of the natural fracture when you do uh, stimulation, okay? It can give operators um, idea on, you know, the compressibility of a rock and the, the severity of subsidence, okay? And all this, okay, when you, uh, when you piece it together, this will influence your reservoir performance. Now, once you have completed all your positive modeling, okay, your numerical um, simulation, then it is time for you to look into the uh, management, okay, your reservoir uh, management, okay. So this is where you look into, um, you know, uh, well bore stability analysis, okay, what kind of, uh, what sort of risk assessment that you can do, uh, what kind of suitable mitigation plan that you can do, okay, you can look into some possible uh, safety and environmental problem, okay, that could arise from that problem, okay, and of course, uh, all this risk tied closely to economics, okay, so you can also model your, um, your, your economic plan, right, and um, that is uh, basically the process, okay, in geomechanics analysis, okay, now, at any stages of the operations, okay, definitely you will obtain the actual data, okay? So whatever that you are doing now is the predicted data, okay? Predicted model, right? Predicted, predicted, um, yeah, predicted model, okay? So when you're actually doing the operation, okay, you will get actual data, okay? So when you have actual data, the geo modeler have to, again, go back into this prediction, okay? And update the model based on the actual data that you have, okay? And then he has, or he or she has to do some comparison, okay? Um, on the work done, okay, and, you know, uh, ways to, to, to improve the prediction, okay? So that's basically the simplified geological, uh, sorry, geomechanics analysis process. So um, given here is just uh, the, the fundamentals, okay, on, you know, what you need to know before you start the geomechanics uh, analysis, okay? I did mention before all this, okay, you have to understand the stress and strain, okay? I did mention what is actually elastic property, elasticity, okay? And mode of rock deformation, okay? Some rock fail under actual splitting, okay? And all that, right? Now, the last part, okay, is the application. How geomechanics is actually uh, applicable, okay? So these are only some, okay, these are only some of the uh, application, okay, that I can, um, that, I, that I feel is uh, much more uh, in concern, okay. So you have um, well bore stability, okay, you have reservoir and perforation behavior, sending problem, hydraulic fracturing, okay. So when we look at geomechanics, okay, geomechanics has come a long way in recent years, okay, past few years, okay, and its application is actually becoming more broad, all right. Um, 
it is becoming an important uh, component to increase the efficiency of operation uh, and definitely okay for uh, safe uh, drilling uh, process okay and also to cut costs okay because you basically can understand what would basically happen okay so this you know this geomechanics analysis are now being integrated into the workflow of you know of uh, field development uh, plan or project okay and yeah it is actually one of the most uh, important and significant uh, part throughout the life of the oil and gas field okay so um that is actually for uh, from me okay so that is basically some of the um my simple presentation okay that give you an idea on what is actually uh, geomechanics okay so um i believe throughout my presentation you could pick up some of the things that you think you could fit in okay or uh yeah some of the things that might interest you to 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 study geomechanics okay uh i put my email address there okay if you have any questions that you would like to ask me okay then please feel free to email me okay i will be much more than happy to discuss all that thank you so that is and it that is for me thank you back to the organizer Thank you, Ms. Wiley, for the presentation. I hope everyone had a wonderful time with us. Uh, now we will start uh, the Q&A with Mr. Andrus uh, Philip. His question is, uh, how will rock respond to stress and strain depending on barium? Depending on, sorry? On barium, barium. Burial? The, the adjective, yeah, burial, yeah, from burial. I'm sorry, I did not catch your uh, question. How will rock respond to stress and strain depending on, on burial? Burial from uh, burying, the act of burying. Uh, is it written in the chat? I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's right there. Oh, burial. Okay, all right. So, how will rock respond to stress and strain depending on burial? Okay, so um, stress. Oh, sorry, uh, burial or deposition. Okay, let's use the term of deposition. So, um, uh, I did mention before. Okay, uh, the thicker your overlying formation. Okay, the higher it is. Uh, uh, the higher the overburden stress that is. Uh, that 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 will come into play. All right. So depending on burial, okay. So um, let's say, okay, we know that sediments again, okay, sediments are deposited in uh, in a in a you know continuous horizontal layer. All right. So when you have, okay, the the the, the more thicker your layer is, okay, the much more greater, okay, the much more greater the uh, stress um in the formation okay so that's basically um how rock uh responds to stress okay the the higher your overburden stress okay then the higher the stress is okay and uh, the higher overburden stress the you know the 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 much uh the higher stress that you will need to actually uh break the formation okay to weaken the the formation all that uh, depends on the um your burial, yes. Okay, thank you for the second question. Uh, by Mute Moyo, is constitutive, constitutive modeling done using a software? Okay, is so. Constitutive modeling done using a software? Okay, all right. So uh, I have the question here. Is constitutive modeling done by using a software? Well, uh, like I said, uh, if you're looking at the simplest constitutive modeling, okay, which is the elastic uh, constitutive model, um, it's not necessary for you to use, uh, to use the software. However, when you're looking into a much more complex constitutive model, okay, 
then definitely uh, the the help of a software will give you better prediction of your rock deformation. Yes. So I have done um, some of my works are in actually um, building a causative model. Okay. So um, yes, I do some. I, I I do use some software, but it's just a very basic, very simple software. So yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, all right. Now for my third question, I, I am single. Can you elaborate the effect of sample size on experimental study? He has two questions, obviously. His first question is, can you elaborate the effect Sample size or an experimental study? Okay, all right. Um, it depends on which. Uh, it depends on which. Uh, it depends on which. What is that word? Sorry. It depends on which uh, standard. Okay. It depends on which standard uh, of testing that you wanted to do that you are referring to. All right. Um, uh, you can refer to ASTM standard, okay? You can refer to uh, ISRM standard, okay? And from here, okay, you can see that um, the ratio of the sample uh, sizes, okay, is just basically uh, usually, okay, one to two, means that uh, the ratio of your diameter to the length, that is basically the, uh, the perfect uh, sample size. However, if you don't have that, for example, you only have a very short core sample, okay? then don't worry, okay, there are some uh, corrections, okay, that you can do to actually um, complement or to correct your, your values. So that is the first question. So the, the second question, are all the strengths of the rock needed for numerical model? Yes, okay, because if you wanted to visualize rock, definitely you will need all of the uh, value of strength, okay? So I do understand that some of some people, okay, sometimes you don't really have all that uh, data on hand, okay? You only have like, for example, compressive strength, okay? You don't have the shear strength data, okay? But um, there are, I would say there are correlations, okay, out there that you can use to predict all this other uh, stress data you don't have. But um, the basic of geomechanics, okay, is for you to understand uh, your rock sample, okay, truly your formation uh, thoroughly. So you have to, um, you need to have that uh, stress uh, data. Should I answer the second, uh, the third question by Muhammad Nouri? Oh, I think oh I should. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, the question is, um, what is the meaning of uh, subsidence in geological understanding and what its importance in geomechanical model. All right, so subsidence. So subsidence is very uh, interesting. Okay, subsidence is uh, basically what happened when uh, you have a flat surface. Okay, you have a flat surface and uh, deep down there, okay, you have your uh, pressure. Okay, you have your fluid pressure, you have your rock pressure and all that. Okay, so uh, that pressure is in equilibrium. Okay, that pressure is in equilibrium. Okay, and what happened when you start producing the, the hydrocarbon? Okay, when you take out the fluid, okay, what happened is that Fluid are they are contained in the pores, okay? They they contains in the the voids of your rock, okay? So when you remove the the fluid, okay, what's going to happen is that the pores will will start to shrink, okay? And when it shrinks, okay, then you will have um you know the the initial volume, okay, of your formation will become smaller, okay? So that on the surface level, this is where you will see that you will have like you know a curve down, okay? So that is actually based on uh, the response, okay, of uh, depletion in the subsurface, that is subsidence. And its importance in geomechanical model, um, basically, for example, you want to lay out a pipeline, okay, or you have a structure, you have your jackup, okay, you need to know subsidence, okay, if you can predict that subsidence will happen over that area, okay, then you can do mitigation, okay, then you can say that that area is, you know, it's a it's dangerous and um, some planning, okay, uh, need to be done for safety purpose. So that's basically um, the function of uh, understanding subsidence in geomechanical model.
All right, so I have another question here from uh, Windu. Is there any other parameter to compare stress and strain value of the rock? How to select all of this parameter to determine stress properly based on rock sample? Is there other parameter to compare stress and strain value of the rock? Um, I do not see any parameter that can be used to compare stress and strain value of the rock other than stress and strain value, okay? Um, I, I, you, you will need to elaborate uh, more, okay, on what actually you are trying to find here, okay? So if you can uh, elaborate more on, you know, the particulars that you would like to, to know, okay, that would be grateful, okay? I would be... Uh, much more happy to assist you. So I think that uh, question is a bit uh, hanging there, all right? Do you have any question? All right, so I have another question here on fundamentals. Please elaborate constitutive law. Okay, so constitutive law basically is the model that you will choose, the model that you will choose to um, to uh, express or to, to understand your uh, deformation, okay? For example, you have a rock, okay? You have a rock and then you have done uh, the laboratory testing, okay? And then you need to have some idea, okay, on how to actually develop the relationship between the stress and the strain, okay? So this is where constitutive modeling comes in, right? Different types of rock will behave under different constitutive model, okay? Some rock will behave under the elastic constitutive model. It means that the rock, okay, will respond to strain the same uh, at the same amount, okay, it, it is actually responding to stress amount, okay? So that is the simplest uh, constitutive model, okay? And um, basically, uh, in general, okay, constitutive model is used for you to visualize the deformation of rock, okay? How rock will actually deform over time, okay? So for example, you have y equals to mx plus c. So you can predict what is the value of y by using this y equals to mx plus c. Similarly, uh, for causative law, okay? When you have that particular causative law, okay, when you establish the uh, relationship, okay, then you can actually predict if your rock will fail under that particular amount of stress or not. So that is why uh, causative law is important. All right. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna pass back the session to the uh, organizer. Okay. I believe uh, nobody else has any question. So uh, all right. This is uh, that's it for today. Thank you all for attending. And uh, thank you, Miss Eiley, for your time. This session will be available on PNA, PNA's YouTube channel, so you can access it at any time. Now, everybody, stay safe. See you soon in future endeavors, and goodbye. Thank you all.